Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. I read a story about a woman who in 1990 went to her favorite Hagen Das ice cream store. And she was there to get her favorite butter crunch ice cream. And, and she was standing in there and she noticed that there was somebody heard somebody else coming in. And after she paid for it, she turned around and there she was face to face with Paul Newman. The heart throb at that time of, of most uh, women, and I can see it on the smiles of I'm getting from women now, that he might still be a heart throb, at least as far as memory is concerned. And she was all startled, and as she looked into his beautiful blue eyes, her knees almost buckled. And she quickly left and went outside to compose herself, and suddenly realized that she didn't have her ice cream cone. So she went back, and as she approached the door, Paul Newman was coming out, and he looked at her and he said, Ma'am, he said, are you looking for your ice cream cone? And she couldn't even say yes, she just sort of nodded, and he said, it is in your purse with the rest of your change. <laughs> you might say that this woman was distracted. You might say that this woman's focus was lost, that somehow or another in encountering Paul Newman, everything that she was concerned about getting that wonderful cone of ice cream had took second place and, and she was distracted. In our scripture today, we find that Martha is distracted. We just have a few verses about this wonderful visit that Jesus uh, makes to the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And here he is with his friends. And as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to the village. Now remember, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem to be crucified, and yet he takes time out to be with his friends. And then the statement that is made by Luke, she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. That would have been outrageous at that time for a woman to sit at the feet of a master. That was a position that was held only by men. And here Jesus is accepting this woman, Mary, sitting at his feet. And then we read that Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. You see, she was doing something that was wonderful. She was doing something that was good. She was serving the Lord Jesus. She was distracted by the preparations because she was concerned to do the right thing for our Lord Jesus Christ. But then we continue to read, Martha was distracted by the preparations that had to be made. She came to him, the Lord, and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. At that moment, Martha overstepped all the rules of hospitality. Not only did she, in front of all of the guests, and there were the disciples, and in all likelihood, wherever Jesus went, there usually was a larger crowd, even than the, just the disciples. Here he is, with, and in light of the fact that Martha is coming to him, he has no choice but to respond to her, but she complains to him. She says, can't you see my sister isn't doing anything? I have to do everything by myself. Have you ever in this congregation thought to yourself when you were serving in the capacity of the council, or when you were serving in a committee, or when you were serving in whatever capacity, that somehow or another you seem to be winding up with the majority of the work and other people were not doing what needed to be done? And here she is doing something good for the Lord, and the Lord seems to be correcting her. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. But what strikes me is that the Lord is not criticizing her service. The Lord is not criticizing what she is doing. The Lord, rather, is criticizing her attitude and how she is doing it. She is putting herself in the center. She is playing the victim. And Jesus points that out very quickly. He says, but Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care? She's even accusing the Lord of not caring. And had you done that? When the Lord hasn't done exactly what you wanted, when he hasn't fulfilled your prayers, even in most serious situations, have you ever thought, Lord, don't you care about me? 
Don't you care what is happening about me? My sister has left me, left me to do all the work by myself. Tell her to help me. She's also more, you know, bossing him around. And frankly, I don't know whether you do it. There are many times when I say to have said to Jesus, Jesus, you've got to do this. You've got to do this. You have to do this for me or for members of my family. And then Jesus goes on and says, Martha, Martha, the Lord answered you, you are worried and upset. Now see, that's the second part. She wasn't just distracted. She was worried and upset. And whenever you and I are worried and upset, we can count on it that that's a sign that our priorities are out of whack. Whenever you and I become worried about something in our lives, and upset about something in our lives, the first question we ought to ask ourselves scripturally is, are my priorities in the right place? Let me read from Matthew. We have a similar thing in Luke, but Matthew, I think, makes it a little bit more clear for me at least. In the sixth chapter of uh, Matthew, we read the following, which I think will help us to get a grips. So do not worry. Is part of the uh, Sermon on the Mount. So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all of these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Do you see the point? Whenever there is a worry, and Jesus points this out to Martha and to Mary, whenever we are worried about something, the first thought that needs to come to my mind and to your mind is my priorities are screwed up. My priorities are out of whack. And in fact, if we look at the passage in Luke that we've been looking at so far with God's Mary and Martha, she, he says, Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. What he's saying is that there's only one priority, not two priorities, not three priorities. There's only one priority, and we need to recognize what that priority is. Most of us would say that the priority varies depending upon the needs, maybe of our family, the needs at work, the needs in our neighborhood, the needs in our church. We have all sorts of ways of identifying what our priority is. But do you think that Jesus is really pointing to any one of those things as the priority? Isn't he really pointing to himself? Isn't he really in essence saying, hey look, Martha, what you're doing is wonderful, your attitude is lousy, but moreover, you have a wrong priority. You're worried about all of these other things that we should be able to, that we should do. All of these service projects that you have going when what you really ought to be concerned about is being with me. Did you ever write, uh, wind up in the morning saying to yourself, I'm going to have devotions? And by the time the evening comes around, you don't have devotions at all. Why? Because other things have taken over your day and have stolen them from you when the Lord maybe wanted to spend a lot of time with you. And so he says, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better. So far then, we find that in this particular case, Martha's attitude is wrong, not that her service, but her attitude is wrong. Her priorities are wrong, because she needs to have the priority of Jesus. And then, we recognize that this is a matter of choice. You see, again and again in Scripture, you will read instances where a short way you or the person had to make a choice, just as you and I have to make choices. Let me give you a couple of examples of, I think that will clarify this. The first one comes from Joshua, the 24th chapter of Joshua. And Joshua is talking to the people of Israel. And he's here's what he's saying. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will choose the Lord. That's one of the best examples 
where the people who confronted with whether they were going to choose God Almighty or choose Baal or one of the other gods that was floating around or that was being touted as being a particular powerful potent God. We find another statement, for instance, where Elijah, in the face of, of um, Ahab, in 1 Kings 18, we read, for example, Elijah has been called to confront King Ahab in the Mount Carmel and all the priests. You know the story, I hope, where all of the cattle are being slaughtered and the issues, whose God is going to prevail. And here is what we read in the 18th chapter. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if it's Baal that is God, follow him. Or the way the English Standard Version puts it, he said, How long are you going to limp between two opinions? And the image is sort of one like this. He said that when we don't choose, when we don't have our priorities right, we go through life like this. As if we were, you know, one leg was shorter than the other. As if we were limping through life. Because we haven't really made a decision whether you're going to stand on the stop, top stair or whether you're going to stand on the lower stair. So it's extremely important for us to recognize that not only are we to have our priorities straight, but that it is a choice that you and I have. You see, Martha was playing the victim, wasn't she? Martha was saying, hey, look, Mary is doing what she wants. She's spending time with you. And poor me, I have to do all the service. She doesn't have to, and she doesn't have to help me. And you seem to be encouraging this, Lord. Lord, would you get your priorities straight and tell her to help me? And Jesus is saying, that's not the victim, Martha. Because the victim always defines the problem as if it belonged to somebody else. When a husband and wife have an argument and the wife says, you never listen to me, she is defining the problem as if it were his problem. Rather than saying to herself, I must not be saying things in a way that makes him want to listen, which would be defining the problem in terms of herself. I'm not talking to you now. But uh, the fact of the matter is that we all have the tendency to define our problems as if they belonged to somebody else. And Jesus is saying, no, no, no. You are the one who makes the choice. It is your choice, and Mary has chosen the better way. In fact, she has chosen the only way that is scripturally sound. Let me put it this way. I first heard about this from Steve Furtick. And Steve Furtick is, I believe, 31 years old. He's only been in the ministry six years. He has um, graduated from seminary, Southern Baptist, and went out and started his own congregation in Charlotte, North Carolina, six years ago. The average attendance of his congregation today is 10,000 persons per Sunday. And I first heard the example that I'm going to use from him, and there are other people who use this like bridges. In fact, we about, uh, I think three or four months ago, talked about this. We can look at life as if it were a pie. I don't know whether you can see all of this, but this is supposed to be a pie. As long as Mark Poker isn't here, I'm not in any trouble because uh, she doesn't have, she would be able to criticize my pie-making ability. Now, this is a pie. One way to look at life is to say that there are all sorts of slices in it. And the first slice, let's call that self. We spend a certain amount of time on ourselves. We shave, most of us do. We shave, we uh, take care of ourselves, cosmetically and otherwise. We spend time relaxing. So part of the pie of life is spent on ourselves. Part of it is spent on our spouse. We have fun together, we do things together, we enjoy ourselves, we make sure that our family increases in a fun level. In addition to that, we have our family. And I'll just abbreviate that. We do things with our family, we spend time with them. We know that we need to spend time because time is the way children spell love. We've talked about that before. 
The way they know that they are loved is by having their parents spend time. The way parents know that they're loved when they grow older is by having their children spend time with them. And one of the most frequent complaints that I hear in nursing homes from people who are in homes is that they're not, the children are not spending enough time with them. And so time is extremely important. In addition to family, there's a job. Most of us have a job. We need to be gainfully employed. And extreme, you know, for some people, it takes almost the entire day, recognizing that there might be a need for some sleep. But most of us spend time on our job. And then there are schools. Either we are in school or our children are in school. But a significant amount of our time is spent in school events, either classroom events or extracurricular events. And then we also have hobbies. We do some things for fun. Some people have very complicated hobbies. Some people have simple hobbies. But we all spend time on vacationing, maybe not enough, but we spend time on hobbies. And then there is church. And so we spend time in church. Sometimes we're recipients, we're relatively passive, and other times we're active. But all of us here, in one way or another, spend time at church. And then we have one left over, and that is Jesus. Most of us, when we look at life, and when we look at God's sovereignty in our lives, we have a tendency to think that Jesus is just part of the pie. I'm going to spend so much time on my spouse, so much time on my job, so much time on my education, so much time on my hobbies, so much time for the church, and the time that I have left over, I'm going to spend with Jesus. And somebody might say, well, Jesus doesn't have a big enough slice of the pie. Let's make this slice of the pie larger. I'm not going to come to church. I'm going to spend some time communing in nature so that I can be closer to Jesus. Or other people might say, you know, I'm spending too much time on my spouse. Maybe I should spend more time on, on Jesus. And how can my spouse argue with that kind of statement? I'm sorry, I won't be able to go to, out to dinner tonight. I'm going to go and have time with Jesus. The problem with this perspective is that Jesus is never satisfied to be just a part of pie. He's not interested in just having a slice of your life. He's not interested in asking you to come along and say, okay, Jesus, you've gone far enough now with me. You can stay right here. The rest of the way I can go by myself. You see, Jesus is not first in the sense that he is most important or more important than all of these others. Although I seriously doubt whether that's true for many of us. Is he really more important? Does he re is that really reflected in our calendars, where we spend the time? Is it really reflected in our checkbooks or in our credit cards? When you took a look, take a look at those, are you really convinced that Jesus is more important than anything else? But the whole perspective is wrong. Because Jesus is not interested in just a slice of you. He's interested in all of you. And so the question is not, is Jesus more important than your hobby? The question is not, is Jesus more important than your job? The question really is, how is Jesus influencing the way you're doing your hobbies? Did you take him with you to the fair? Did you see opportunities when you were at the fair where you could witness to Jesus because he is so much a part of your life? You see, Jesus is interested in all of you. He wants all of you regardless of who you are. He wants all of us. He doesn't just want to have the primary role in our lives. He wants to have all of our lives. And he wants us to make sure that Jesus is first in every one of these areas. And if you have any difficulty wondering what that would look like, what does it look like to put Jesus first in my relationship to my spouse? If you're having problems identifying that, or if you're having problems identifying what does it look like for Jesus to be first in the school system, or Jesus first in my job, that may just be an indication 
that you haven't taken Jesus seriously enough in each one of these, these areas. Let me give you an example. If I were to say that my relationship with my wife is the most important relationship that I have, there are other relationships that I have, but my relationship with my wife is, is the most important. We're married. That's the most important relationship that we have. If I were to say that, which would be very similar to saying that uh, my relationship with Jesus is the most important. But then when we say that we have the tendency to believe that Jesus is most important, but we also have all sorts of idols that we drag along with us. We're going to spend money on being successful, spend money on being achieved, and time on having achievement, and we turn all of these different love, achievement, success, all of these things into small idols that we don't want to give up. Small gods. Okay? Now let me go back to my wife. My wife and I have a great relationship. And we like to go out and eat. And on one occasion, we were at Baker's, and several of you see me sitting there with another woman. And not just sitting there with another woman, but holding her hand. And not just holding her hand, but on several occasions, as you watch me in perhaps some degree of horror, I lean over and kiss her. Not just on the cheek, but on the lips. At which point, Shirley Britton decides to get up and to say, I've had enough of this, and I'm going to confront Pastor Scherner. And so he comes over to me and he says, Pastor, he says, uh, I notice you're with another woman. I said, well, Shirley, would you like me to introduce you to her? Uh, would you like to get to know her better? Uh, Charlie said, no, well, wait, wait a second. He said, you're with another woman. He says, uh, aren't you married? And I said, oh, yeah, I take my wife here more often than this woman. I, well, I only date her several times a year. And, uh, you know, actually, next year, next month, I'm going to be dating somebody else. Uh, Charlie would probably shake his head and say to himself, what kind of relationship does he have? Oh, when I come home, and I say to my wife, honey, I've had a good time in Vegas. She said, oh, were you there with such and such? And I said, yeah, I was. She said, oh, isn't that nice? Did you have a good time? Do you think my wife would say that? I ran it by her as an example yesterday, and she said, you're dead. <laughs> and I don't leave her. You should see her wheel and knife. She's taking a lesson from her eye. No. Uh, to see the point, the point is this. If you and I say that God is most important, but we're not going to stop dating all of these other gods, all of these idols. You would say there's something wrong with you, just as you would tell me that there's something wrong with the way I am relating to my wife and relating to other dates. God does not want us to have other gods. He is a jealous God. He is a God who wants us for himself, for our own good. He doesn't want us for his own good. He knows that the only way that you and I will ever thrive is to put him first in all things. As Paul says in Colossians, that he is preeminent over all things. That he is supreme over all things. That he is first in all things. And now let's go back to Jesus. And Underneath all of that, I think what Jesus is really saying when he says, Martha, Martha, which is a term way, a term of endearment, it's a way of expressing endearment in that world. And he says, Martha, Martha, he says, I miss you. I miss you. I miss what would be possible for you. Wasting your time on all of these other things when you could be with me. I miss you. That's what Jesus is saying to each one of us here. If we're putting other gods before you, what Jesus is really saying is, I miss you. Come back. Come to me. Sit at my feet. Learn from me. Be there with me. Don't waste your time dating other gods. He loves each one of us. Isn't that great?